Hi everyone, this is Alec from Reddit's Hex Encounter community. Thank you very much for joining me today as I resume my streaming schedule. Uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, your patience and bearing with me with some uh, holiday travel. Uh, sorry for the interruption on the streaming, but happy to get into this again with uh, a title uh, here by Fifth Column Games called Where There Is D Discord, War in the South Atlantic. This title here is a solitaire game that is a, um, uh, a game simulating the conflict between the British and the Argentine forces uh, in, during the 1982 Falklands War or the uh, Malavinas War. Um, uh, so for a little bit of the historical context on this one, um, in 82, um, this is a, a, an island where the uh, there's a territorial dispute. It was a, a holding uh, of the British, uh, overseas holding of the, the British Empire um, that is very proximate to Argentina uh, and as an archipelago. And the Argentina, Argentinians um, felt that they had uh, or uh, had jurisdiction over those islands, uh, a claim which the British uh, refuted. Uh, the Argentine military uh, seized the islands um, and uh, a British task force was uh, sent to um, recapture the islands in 1982. And so this is really a an early 80s and, and a mid-Cold War uh, naval air engagement, uh, which is one of the few historical examples that we have of uh, air-sea battles from that time frame. So uh, we'll go ahead and go here. Now, uh, I know some of you vastly uh, prefer uh, uh, tabletop board games uh, when we can, and um, I, I do have to say I agree with you. Uh, this is one of those cases where um, until I uh, get my Christmas list uh, fleshed out and I get a new camera and some new mounts here for my table setup, I simply don't have the correct geometry to stream this actually on my table. It is two full uh, mounted boards that get placed side by side. It's just a monster of a production. It's, it's a huge game. Uh, I have to say very high quality production, high quality components. The designer uh, really decided to pull out all the stops and um, you know it, it did price the game up uh, quite a bit, particularly when you compare it to other solitaire games of this ilk um, that it compares to. It, it prices in at a much heavier price point. Um, and uh, as such, it only had a very limited production run. Um, uh, but, you know, it certainly has very high quality. The high price point in the limited production run and the um, uniqueness of this conflict puts us in grail game status for quite a few gamers. So this here is the board, um, and I'll kind of give you a tour of it as we go around here. Uh, as you can see, it's mostly a lot of areas. It's, it's just placements and tracks, uh, and there'll be a lot of rolling. I won't spend a lot of time here zoomed out at this highest level, but I'll start here just to kind of give you the, the tour here in the Vassal module. Uh, first of all, let me somewhat minimize my uh, status display. No one's chatting with me. There we go. Okay, um, so here in the top right, we, have, we can see kind of uh, the rough placement of the Falklands related to the eastern coast of Argentina. We also see here that we've got the, um, uh, the task force display. And so this is a fairly uh, abstract uh, representation of where the escorts and the troop ships and um, the various uh, other forces are in regards to the core of the task force or the, the carriers uh, and the uh, troop ships. And so coming in from uh, the, the, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, the, the, the British are steaming west, roughly west by southwest. Uh, and so you can see here that we have a number of boxes to hold the British forces, and then a number of pips and um, uh, numbers here that correspond to die rolls on a, a 2d6. So those of you that have played Settlers of Catan will uh, you know, appreciate and uh, um, uh, this mnemonic. It's actually a fairly useful one. So as you can see, generally speaking, we're expecting the threats to the task force to come from the west, i.e. The, the shores of Argentina. Um, uh, we will note that this is a solitaire from the British perspective. The game system are playing the uh, Argentine forces. And so we have the task force display here. 
We have the troop display uh, here on the right, which represents the, um, the Marine forces uh, loaded on the various troops transports, uh, steaming along with the task force. Uh, a number of them steamed uh, at the start uh, of the movement. Uh, however, others joined uh, a long route. Uh, down at the bottom right, we have the San Carlos display. This is used in the late game to actually resolve conflict between the Argentine forces that were able to get bedded down on the islands and then the, the British forces that are trying to recapture the island. On the bottom here, we have the Sea Harriers and Air Operations display. Um, uh, several different squadrons of Sea Harriers are embarked on the two aircraft carriers that came with the task group, the Hermes and... Um, uh, we have the, the Invincible, and this will represent their um, battle rhythm as they get flown, recovered, and regenerated. We have naval patrol boxes here, which are fairly abstract spaces representing the near coastal waters of Argentina. The exclusion zone immediately surrounding the task force um, for which the, um, the, the British had quite clearly signaled that any ship entering the exclusion zone was subject to fire without warning. And then the search zones, kind of the, the gray area in between. And so British submarines represented by these counters and Argentine naval forces can uh, be here as well. Several reminder markers regarding detection bonuses, several uh, Argentine Air Force uh, units here, which will, uh, based on the range of the aircraft, occasionally be generated to come out and uh, find the task force and attack them with some number of uh, Exocet missiles, potentially, which would be problematic. We have here the uh, Argentine naval forces ready to sortie. Those will come out. This uh, area on the top left represents a combination of a turn display, and so we do have uh, the turn marker here on May 1st, but it's also then just a general status track. And so uh, this uh, exoset here on five represents that there are five exosets I have to worry about, or five units of exosets. Then we've got supply on the island. Um, Operation Sutton is uh, queued here on the 21st. That was the scheduled start of the naval uh, uh, landings, uh, which is there for reference uh, only. Um, we may or may not trigger the invasion on that date. And then the ensigns here uh, on represent when uh, other naval forces join the uh, task force. Several weather markers to remind us of weather effects. That will be random. And then we have an opinion display uh, here at, as the semicircle. This opinion display represents uh, both the um, public and international opinion. Uh, by public opinion, we mean the domestic uh, UK opinion. We also then have a number of other... Um, factors that could come into play here, be it an arms embargo or um, uh, new arms or intervention by the Chileans or by the Soviets. We have, uh, let's see here, scramble modifiers and sortie levels uh, for what uh, we expect to see that the Argentine Air Force will come out with, and then a combat display here that will help us resolve conflicts. A couple decks of cards, and uh, that looks good. So for those of you that um, are here live for the stream, uh, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate that you're here. Please do um, drop uh, a hello in chat. Let me know that you're here. Love to have you here. And also do ask your questions, um, clarifications, or give me suggestions. I'll, I'll get to a lot of points in the stream where you know, we'll have a decision to make, and I'm happy to take uh, your input on what that decision should be. Um, but more so just so I know that I'm not talking to myself. And the plan will, uh, that will let the stream go for about two hours, uh, and we'll see what we're doing here. Um, and so I'm just going to you know, go off the, 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 the play aid and the sequence of play in the rule book and kind of go through this. One note on the rule book, while it is fairly clearly organized and fairly high production value, there is uh, an errata clarification document that goes along with it, which you should have if you're playing the game. Uh, that weighs in at, how, how long is this thing? 14 pages of errata clarification. Now, I'll note of those 14, um, 12 and a half of them are simple clarifications. It's, it's them going into um, some more uh, verbose discussion on what they meant in a rule versus fixing a rule. So really, it's only about a page and a half of fixes, but 14 pages of errata, which is a lot to digest. This is in addition to the rule book, which as uh, out of the box comes in at um, 60, 59 pages when you include the designer notes. So it's a fairly large rule book. 
Um, but this isn't an encyclopedic rulebook a la Advanced Squad Leader. This isn't something that's going to be that heavy um, and, and that much in it. There's just a lot of detail here. So what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go off the sequence of play and I'm just gonna go top to bottom and hop around the rule book when I need it. Now this is one thing where the structure of the rule book is a little bit lacking. While it is very clearly organized and I uh, can leaf through it here and very clearly see that here is in uh, rule eight is how the Argentines target the task force and 9.0 is air to air combat and you know there's uh, it roughly goes sequentially as I go through this. The sections themselves are not in the order that you would encounter them in a, um, a, in a turn of the sequence of play. So you kind of have to hop around the rule book initially. These systems aren't that complex though. There's not that much going to them and, and um, you, you do enough turns where you really do start to get it under your fingers. So it's, it's, it's really not that big of an ask, uh, it's, although it is a little bit regrettable that you have to hop around so much. All right, so going through setup here, um, the board is, uh, we're, we're in Vassal, so the board is there. The event cards are shuffled. The situation report uh, cards are sequential, so those are already set. Uh, the Argentine aircraft are all at their bases and ready to go, okay? Um, and the Argentine vessels are all off map. And, and here, um, Vassal doesn't have an uh, explicit off map area, but here they're represented off map. British troop transports are loaded, and I will go ahead and use the default load here in the Vassal module. This is a decision that the player does get, and I'll zoom in here on the troop transports. Um, you notice we have two converted passenger liners, which are transporting a rather large number of forces. Uh, and then we have a number of um, troop transports. Um, I will uh, keep this default loaded, load at. There is a special rule here that the Blues and Royals unit here may not be loaded on a troop transport. And so I, I do have it, I'm sorry, may not be loaded on a passenger liner. So I do have it on the troop transport. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm essentially trying to spread out my high value units as much as possible. I don't want to lose this uh, 10 uh, strength um, uh, uh, SBS unit, um, you know, for uh, an Argentine uh, fighter going for one of the passenger liners. So I'm going to kind of spread these out, I like having uh, tens and eights here, and then some of the lower values on these. So we'll keep those default uh, levels. Uh, the Sea Harriers are already deployed. Oh, and I, yeah, I apologize uh, for any poor performance on the laptop. I do have something else running while I'm doing this, but we'll keep pressing on. Um, turn track is set up, Argentine supply is set up, exit sets, uh, scramble modifier, we're all good. Um, let's see here, yep, that's on the zero on the track. Um, task force, all right, so here's our first decision is how are we deploying this task force? There will be more vessels that join us as we move on. And looking here at the reinforcements tab, um, th quite thankfully here, the Vassal module designer um, listed these things all out by date. So uh, those will come in when they will. But for now, I have these forces here on the right to array around uh, my task force, however I please. Um, I'll note that um, a, a unit needs to be present in one of the display boxes to be... Um, uh, uh, to, uh, to participate in screening there or engaging uh, naval or surface forces. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be less concerned about the ship that I have uh, in the southeast approach, um, much more worried about what I get in the west approach. Uh, I'm going to look at um, the combat chart, uh, the CRT that comes with the game, uh, which we will notice that um, I don't believe that this is included in the Vassal module, it is not. It is included in the rulebook in the PDF of, I believe it's included in the rulebook, and the PDF of which is available uh, on BoardGameGeek and from the designer. Uh, also on BoardGameGeek recently is the um, briefing booklet for uh, decoding the events. That's somewhat of a recent development. Uh, Dan Hodges, the um, designer, indicated, um, uh, not quite committally, but indicated his um, desire to not make it hard for the community to play the game, that he would be open to getting a copy of it or a scan of it available, and then someone just you know scanned it and made it available. So, um, But at any rate, uh, all of these units have different radar lock numbers, or essentially um, 
uh, I'll need to roll a d10. They have, uh, depending on what type of escort it is, a number that I'll have to low roll beneath in order to successfully detect an incoming target. And so these uh, T22 class frigates are actually somewhat um, less capable than, say, the um, Invincible right here, the radars on, on the, the, the carrier. So uh, that will play into mind. Also, the missile systems. Different missile systems um, on these include the Sea Wolf, the Sea Cat, the Sea Slug, and the Sea Dart. And um, they're available at different ranges. For instance, the Sea Dart is available at range 30, whereas the Sea Wolf has a max range of range 10. And they all have different hit numbers. And so um, uh, I, I believe a lot of times in this game, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be rolling a, a D whatever, a D4, a D6, a D8, a D10, a D12, and something will happen on a 1. And so for the Seawolf at point blank at range 1, it will hit on a D4 roll of a 1. Um, so uh, that's pretty capable compared to for, say, the longer range shots on the Sea Slug, which will be um, uh, on a D10. So let me just kind of array these forces here um, and see what I can get. If I have any T-42 class um, destroyers, and I have plenty of those, those are my, kind of my most capable detection platforms. So I'm going to make sure that I got one of these out here on each of these main approaches. Potentially I could have them even far away from the core. This defense zone represents an area really pushing forward, bounding forward. Um, uh, but I don't think this early in the cruise I want to have them that far out. Um, so, okay, so I, I, those have sea darts, and the sea darts are a fairly capable system, so I'm pretty okay with those being there right now. Uh, what do I have left? I have um, two city class um, destroyers. I've got an RTH class frigate, uh, T21 and T22. Um, I think the, the city class ones are then going to be some of my next most capable detection platforms. So I will, again, put these here, um, which is fine. And then this has a detection of four. This has a detection of that, uh, T21 three pass. And this has a three. So my next most capable detection are these systems. I'll array them over here. All right. Um, and so what I'll do for the rest of this is I will put in a, one of these frigates close in to provide additional fire uh, power and nest it in with the carriers. Um, I will put one of these guys here in the southeast, and then I will stack a little bit towards where I know I'm probably going to have some more problems. So let me do that. Okay, so that's a part of the initial deployment, and we'll call that done. So uh, that is our task force deployment, and um, we have the player aid. So we are now ready to begin our turn. Um, okay, so uh, skipping to the start of the uh, sequence of play, First thing is advance the turn marker, and as is standard in war games, you do not do that on the first turn. We'll start on turn one, and now we'll do our weather event. If you're reading through the manual or looking online, one confusing thing that they do for nomenclature here is when they want you to roll two d6s, uh, instead of using the shorthand in, the, in uh, the game of 2d6 as is proper, uh, the uh, shorthand is a capital d12. Uh, as in, don't roll 1d12, roll 2d6s um, for, uh, as a capital D12. Uh, and um, that's pretty darn confusing. So what I'm instead going to say is I'm just going to call it a 2d6. So uh, for my weather roll, it'll be 2d6 here. I rolled a 5. So I'll come down here to, oh boy. All right, I'll come down here. Uh, to five, which is gray weather. I'll send that to uh, current weather. And let me flip it over here to see what that means. Um, this general gray should be no effect. Yep, no effect. Okay, so the no particular weather effect this turn, which is uh, fine. Uh, and we'll now go to events. So we'll draw from the event deck. Uh, in Vassal, this is random, so I'll just Yep, all right, so I'll draw the event. 
which is a 33. Uh, what's this say? While the cat's away. And there, there's an Irish flag. Okay, so I'll read you from the, uh, what might be the playbook in a GMT game. Uh, while the cat's away. If it's turn 18 or later, discard this card, draw another, we're fine. Intelligence reports that the IRA are preparing to use the Falklands Malvinas conflict as an opportunity to launch a major offensive in South uh, Armagh. You may, A, this is one of the things we first get, get a, pretty much a binary choice. Do nothing uh, on the morning of May 21st, three uh, British observation posts, uh, a barracks and two police stations in Northern Ireland are stormed and overrun by 200 heavily armed IRA volunteers. The IRA declares free Arma uh, a no-go area for British forces. Public opinion in Britain uh, is stunned by this new military reversal. Domestic opinion falls by two. So this is going to be something that we're going to have to watch is make sure that we maintain support for our conflict. The alternative to this is to send reinforcements to Northern Ireland. Take one of the parachute regiments and remove them permanently from the game. If the unit is not being transported by QE2 or Canberra, also remove its parent troop ship permanently from the game. Okay, so my options here are to come over here to my troop display and take one of these parachute regiments and get rid of it, which uh, would be bad, or to go ahead and sacrifice to public opinion. Um, let me go ahead and say that, uh, and maybe I'll just role play this, that, uh, that, that the British uh, and, and Mrs. Thatcher uh, would have been, uh, uh, Miss Thatcher would have been very interested in uh, securing the um, uh, domestic support and that they would not have wanted uh, the, the possibility of losing um, uh, something uh, quite so uh, visibly. So my uh, available, oh boy, there are only two parachute regiments. I have second and third. They are both on transports. So this is going to complicate actually my decision from a game standpoint. These transports are something else to get sunk other than my carriers. Uh, and so while, of course, nobody wants to lose a transport with a regiment on it, um, maybe that happens. So, okay, so we will say that uh, third para here uh, received orders uh, from uh, to turn around and steam back to the British Isles um, and uh, to help quell uh, the intelligence coming out of that Irish uh, uprising. So... We'll take care of that, and that was the Nordic Fury. So let's uh, just drop this here off on the corner. Let me find Nordic Fury. Uh, I'm just gonna be here somewhere. Oh, unless it hasn't steamed yet, that could be the case. Um, reinforcements. Yeah. Well, we will say, since oh, actually here, here's some more troop ships that come later. All right, um, we'll say it's gone. We'll make sure that we don't put Nordic Fury on the board. Um, and I don't already see it there. I see St. Edmund, uh, which is right here. Nordic Fury is probably coming on the 25th, actually. So that's that's probably correct. So we'll just say that it never steams. Let me pull that out right now. Where are you? Reinforcements. Oops, not Argentine. There we go. Yep, 25th. Okay, Nordic Fury. All right, so those guys are not coming in. They never steamed. Okay. Well, that event stunk. Um, most of them are going to kind of be like that. So we'll work our way back down here, um, and I will go ahead and discard this. There's no reason to keep this around. I'll pull up the situation report. So this situation report essentially tells us what's happening. This also represents the progress of the task force to the islands. Uh, pulling this is always optional. You don't actually have to um, pull a, a card and change the situation report. You can choose not to on a turn. That essentially represents the, the task force taking a day to kind of 
not make significant steaming progress getting closer to the islands and regrouping and doing other things. Uh, in, in fact, there are, um, I believe, only 16 situation report cards, uh, but 21 days until the plan launch. So even if you want to go on schedule, you have five days of just not getting closer. Because as you can imagine, as you get closer to Argentina, we're going to get more and more uh, pushback. Uh, there's information here then as it relates to which air base we're going to see uh, being our big problem. Uh, and we're going to see uh, uh, Trelu being w where we're going to have bombers coming out of. We'll also see the air alert assessment or how many uh, they're going to be willing to sortie and uh, the air effort based on all available sources is light AEA. So uh, that will do that. Okay, so that's the situation report and we'll leave that there. And now we'll do task force deployment. Uh, I will say that uh, we get no reinforcements. Uh, we'll do submarine placement. So I can, th these are already uh, pretty close uh, to the, the action. They are not necessarily steaming with the group. I'm gonna place one of my submarines um, in the coastal waterways. Um, this is politically maybe a bit dangerous to be operating so close to, Ar in, um, essentially in Argentine waters and the rest of these in the search area. Um, the, the, it's gonna take a while before the Argentine uh, naval forces sortie and if they do to get as close as the exclusion zone. So I think this is probably a good balance of forces. Uh, task force display placement, I just did that on setup, I'm pretty happy. And now we can do cap. So uh, for cap deployment or, or um, sending out these sea harriers, um, this is done per uh, rule 3.5. And uh, again, we're pretty far out, so I'm not expecting a, a large amount of uh, pushback. Um, and to do this, I can sortie no more than two harriers in any one zone. Um, um, only Harriers from the same carrier group may be placed together, so I can't mix and match. If two Harriers from different flights are patrolling together, they lose the ability to bounce enemy aircraft, and they may only patrol in a zone that already contains surface vessels. They're not going to patrol away from uh, a friendly uh, ship that's going to be queuing them with radar. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to take one flight each from um, each of the carriers, and I'm going to put these on cap. Um, again, I anticipate um, potentially strong response here from uh, the northwest, which I don't have uh, an additional ship for, so I will actually put two aircraft there. I will still put two aircraft in the western approach. That is still clearly most likely. And now I'll do singleton aircraft here in the southern approach and over the task force itself. Uh, again, completely unlikely, but this is where they're going to try to get to. So there is my um, the, the CAP or the Combat Air Patrol assignments. Uh, I could do supply interdiction if it was late enough. Uh, essentially, the task force is not close enough to the island to start interdicting the aerial resupply of the Argentine forces on the island. Um, so we'll just verify that. Um, yeah, sit rep card number four or above, I may attempt to interdict the supply. So we're not close enough yet. Um, okay, SAS marker placement. Uh, I got special forces in South America, and they are going to be watching uh, certain bases and providing uh, intelligence. So they, will, of course, will look here at the only one that could possibly sortie right now, which are, is uh, Trailer. <clears throat> okay, so this looks like it's my deployment step. Uh, now moving on, oh, I guess I can uh, cycle through these. Weather, event draw, sit rep, deployment. Okay, so now the naval deployment. So this is going to be um, kind of a mixed bag for them. Uh, we'll notice that none of them are ready to go. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, fearing the British Navy, uh, they were hesitant to put themselves at significant risk. So what we're going to do is I'm going to um, just hop to the correct uh, section of the rules right now, just make sure I get this correct. Start with the sub submarine deployment in rule 13.2. The submarines are going to be a bit more adventurous. Uh, but what I'm going to do is um, we are going to roll 3D4 for each of the submarines, and they have two submarines. And um, if any of the D4s come up as a one, it will sortie. And it will depend on how many ones uh, I roll to determine where they go. 
So uh, we'll start here with uh, the first submarine rolling 3d4. And we notice I don't roll any one. So it actually uh, stays in port. The next one that will, oops, not d12. Oh, there is a d12 button. Get out of here. Okay. Um, I'll note that for the future. Next, I'll do 3d4 again for the second submarine. And ooh, okay. So there's two ones there. So this guy gets pretty bold and he will go all the way out to the search box. So if I now hop down here to the search box, we'll notice that it is populated with one Argentine submarine, uh, the ARA San Luis, and uh, two British submarine, um, Her Majesty's uh, ship Splendid and Conqueror. So um, I kind of like my odds on this one, and we'll see how uh, this goes with uh, submarine combat when we get there. Uh, but now that we've done the submarine sortie, uh, we will now see uh, where the task forces get placed. So uh, each of these will roll a die, uh, a single die, uh, with the carrier group being the least likely to deploy. It will roll a d8. On a roll of a 1, it is about to be readied, and I'll move it into the ready for war box, uh, which is right next to it. On the roll of anything else, it doesn't get ready. So here's the carrier roll. Oh, wow, okay, so the carrier uh, pr prepares to sortie. Interesting. Uh, next, I'll do the battle group. That'll uh, go on a 1d6. It also, wow, okay, we're about to get uh, quite a few um, naval actions. This is good. And finally, we'll go with the patrol, which uh, needs a successful roll on a d4. Okay, the patrol stays where it is. So they are now in the ready for war box. Um, so after these rolls, all Argentine cast group counters. Um, um, uh, so if after these rolls, they're all off board, we are done and we'll move on. Um, uh, otherwise, um, now um, let's see here. Uh, if after all these rolls, all Argentine DAS group counters remain off board, then the Argentine fleet deployment is over for this turn. Move on. Once these rolls are completed, move all task force counters from the ready to war box to the um, Puerto uh, Belgrano box. Okay. Which is actually where the other submarine is. So this turn, they have readied. That was their job. Uh, and next turn, they will potentially. Uh, put to sea. All right, so getting through this. Uh, so that was the um, surface group readiness, and then there were no deployment rolls. They had already, uh, there's no one to deploy. Uh, now we're going to go to um, the submarine search roll. We're going to the submarine combat. So this we will have potentially, since we do have two subs that are, are um, or three subs, uh, that are potentially hunting each other in the same box. Uh, we're still in the naval section, uh, 13 of the rules, now looking at 13.5. Uh, naval combat is resolved before air combat in this game. Um, and so the first thing that we're gonna do is look to see um, that we do have a, a, a box here that contains vessels of both navies. Uh, that is now contested. Now for each British submarine in this box, I will roll one die of the value indicated on the detection roll section of the combat chart uh, to see what we get. So for instance, I have a British submarine that is um, in the search box that is searching for another submarine. And so looking at the chart here, the um, uh, roll would be a D8. So each of the British submarines get to roll a D8, and on a one, they have detected and can engage the submarine. So we'll start with the first submarine, no joy. Second submarine, also no joy. Okay, so that was that. Um, so we skip the combat step since the British have not found their quarry. Uh, now we repeat the detection process for the Argentine submarines remaining there. Um, the Argentine submarines use their own detection block. They are somewhat less effective than the British, uh, whereas they are rolling a D10 here to find the opposing submarines. So uh, we'll go ahead and roll that to 1D10. And uh, that was essentially a roll of a 0, not a 1, um, or you know the 10. So they do not find their quarry either. 
So um, a, lot, a whole lot of nothing with the subs so far. They are, they are in the same water space, but they have not um, detected one another to begin an engagement. Um, okay, and so that's that. So now we move on with, uh, from the sub v sub combat to the next step, which would be uh, the submarine versus um, um, uh, a surface combatant. Um, there are no Argentine surface combatants to engage. Now we have the Argentine surface groups versus the British subs. Again, the Argentine surface groups have not to put to sea. Argentine Navy versus the British task force. Again, this would involve the Argentine Navy being put to sea. Now, scramble surveillance and early warning. So we have now reached um, the step of the um, sequence of play where the Air Force comes into play. So looking at the sequence of play here, um, we're on now on step K for Kilo, and uh, this is rule section five. So we'll hop back to 5.1, so you can see how a bit nonlinear this is, going from rules 13 for the Navy to rule five for the Air Force. Um, but the scramble roll, okay, so uh, each <clears throat> raid starts with a scramble segment. The scramble determines which Argentine aircraft, if any, will attempt to engage the task force. Um, before I do this, though, we need to figure out if this is even happening. Every turn, the Argentine aircraft attempt to launch a series of raids. The maximum number of raids that can be launched this turn is displayed in the Argentine Air Effort Assessment. So if we come back to this earlier card here, the Air Effort Assessment listed on the bottom is 1. So they will at max sort, um, generate one sortie to come and get us. Um, what raids will continue one after another until they've done that or they wave off. Um, so, okay, the scramble roll takes place as follows. We'll look at the air alert assessment. That's the top number here, and we note that that's a two. Um, we'll note the current scramble modifier. You can see that on the center of the scramble modifier display is still a zero. So we'll roll an unmodified D10 uh, and are looking for a number less than two. Okay, if the modified scramble roll is equal to or greater than the air alert assessment, the Navy and Air Force stand down, and we see we're done. So I'm um, looking for a hard one here on a D10. No dice. So uh, the the Argentine Navy is, uh, I'm sorry, Air Force is uh, not committing at this point, and we are going to hop all the way to the intern segment. Uh, the Harriers recover, and so I will send all of them back, uh, just so I can do a quick thing here. Let's see here. Um, flown is Control G, so I'll just lasso all these guys. All right, so they all went back to their home flown boxes. Um, they now, we now do refitting, so ones in arming go to the carriers and the ones in flown go to arming, so we'll just manually move those. They will not be available tomorrow, uh, but their other um, aircraft are. Uh, no scramble marker, no naval detection marker, no Harrier recovery markers, no submarine counters, no weather. All right, we'll remove the weather marker. I guess we'll do that. <clears throat> and that's the turn. Okay, so that was turn one. Let's now, uh, yeah, I guess we'll go through this. No combat, no combat. Hmm, would like to skip all this uh, end of turn. Okay. And so now uh, we're moving on to turn two. Advancing the turn marker. Doing our weather on the D12. I rolled a six, which is still gray. So uh, this will again be no effect for weather on anyone. Event draw. Let's see what event we get. All right, uh, this is event three. The Soviets are doing a bit of saber rattling. Let's see what that means. Coming here to the Intel booklet for event three. This card is drawn on turn one, discard. Luckily we're on turn two, I guess. Um, flavor text here, Soviet Premier Brezhnev delivers a statement condemning Western imperialist designs on the liberty and national integrity of the South American states. In response, the United Nations Secretary General privately asks for a temporary cessation of hostilities and a 48-hour ceasefire. The Secretary General staff may leak the request to media. So we have two options. One is we can accept the ceasefire. Um, uh, 
and comes into effect for two turns, and international opinion will rise by one, although we're already pegged out. Also, if domestic opinion is currently four or less, domestic opinion rises. Um, however, if domestic opinion is currently six or more, domestic opinion falls. The British public is in no mood for compromise. So we could accept the ceasefire and lose domestic opinion, or we could reject the ceasefire. International opinion will fall by one. Also, if domestic opinion is less than five, domestic opinion falls. So I get to sacrifice international opinion or domestic opinion. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take the, well, let's agree to the ceasefire. Um, interestingly, I wonder what the effect of the ceasefire is. <laughs> um, let's take a look at the errata real quickly uh, for card number three. Let's see. So it's not errata. Um, but perhaps there's a clarification um, on the ceasefire. Let's just take a look here. There's some time to plant. Okay, there's... Um, okay, and there's no um, further uh, discussion on that specific card. So, what I think we will, oops, um, never mind. Uh, there's a specific rule section for ceasefires, which is rule section 17. So this will also factor into the decision. So what happens on a ceasefire, um, which will last for two turns, it halts almost all military operations for the period over which it is observed. The ceasefire's duration will be expressed in terms of number of days, and the first day of the ceasefire is counted from the movement, the moment the event card uh, beginning is put into play. So it would be this turn and next turn. Only a few actions can't are performed during ceasefire uh, on the abbreviated ceasefire sequence of play. So um, we would do uh, the international and domestic opinion adjustment as stated on the card. Um, the Argentines are still reinforcing their positions on the island during the ceasefire, so um, it would be bad to accept a ceasefire late in the game. The deployment rules um, for task groups off board are made normally, um, and they advance normally. So they can prepare their navy uh, during a ceasefire, which they would anyway. And we'd rearm. Okay, I'm actually going to accept the ceasefire. We're far enough out here where that's not giving much to, to them. And I'd rather lose the domestic opinion at this point than international opinion. Because as international opinion falls, other things will go through here. So I will leave this event marker here. So I remember that it happens. But we'll take the hit on uh, domestic opinion. And we have a ceasefire in effect. So um, um, going through here now, the abbreviated sequence of play. We've done that adjustment. Um, and now all that will essentially happen here is we will take a look. Oops. Um, interesting. Um, so I note here is that um, in the abbreviated ceasefire sequence of play, um, I do not have a sit rep card a turn. So essentially, I'm not. I am not steaming close to the islands. So this would be two days of uh, me burning uh, time on the clock without getting any closer. And I don't know if I want to. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to give that time. Okay, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to go ahead and discard this. We are, I'm going to take the international hit. And we are going to um, press on and not uh, accept the ceasefire, temporary ceasefire. Okay, so that was the event. Now we're going to do the situation report. We will steam closer. Now we're in set rep two. So we note here, I can go ahead and discard one. So we don't have it. There we go. Okay, so we note that um, not much has changed here, actually. Uh, we're still getting closer. But the Argentine response is not going to be any different. Um, so we've got that. Uh, task force deployment. We get no reinforcements on turn one. Um, reinforcements won't come in here until turn 13, maybe. Does that look right? Let me take a look at this. Yeah, 13 May. So we get no reinforcements just yet. Um, I could move the British submarines, and at this point, I still like my disposition. I still like having one guy here on coastal, both of these guys here in search. I could move the task force display. And again, I'm fairly happy with where they are. And I can do my cap placement. And I will kind of keep going with what I had there until I start losing forces. I think that this is a, a pretty reasonable way to do it. So let me put 
one of these each, and then I'll put um, stacks of these guys here in the most likely, and then perhaps reasonably unguarded without really overcommitting my Harriers at this point. Uh, no supply introduction, we're only at turn two, and I'll keep the SAS marker where he is. So that will be the end of uh, the deployment. Now we'll do the Navy. So uh, I will give, let's see, let's make sure I don't miss something here on the submarine deployment. I'm flipping around in the rule book. If you did join the stream, uh, thank you for coming by. Appreciate you having you here. Do say hello. Let me know you're here. Uh, give me, uh, uh, and, and do jump in if you have any questions. As you can see in the stream, I do have chat up. So uh, we'll uh, get, get to your questions. And of course, I'm always happy for your suggestions on what we should be doing. Okay, uh, let's see here. At the start of each deployment phase, roll 3d4 for each submarine in um, uh, Puerto Belgrano or at sea. And um, if you don't roll any ones, keep it where it is. If you do roll, uh, count the ones. So I'll start with the guy um, in the search box. I'll roll his 2d4. Oops, I'm sorry. I'll re-roll that. He rolls 3d4. Okay, he actually stays right where he is. I'll now roll for the one that's currently in port, and 3d4 on him. And he rolled a single one, which will put him in the coastal area. So we will send him to coastal. Okay. So that is the Argentine submarine deployment. Moving now to the naval preparations and then the naval deployments. Um, uh, roll for die for each task group currently off board to see if it comes on board. So we'll start here with the patrol. He'll roll a d4 and he's not ready. Um, okay, and now if there are any task group counters in port, and there are, I now have two task groups in port. They now re uh, prepare to hunt the Royal Navy. I will roll 3d6 for each task force and on a one, It'll go to coastal on a two to search and on a three to the exclusion. So like the like the, the submarines, but with these sixes. And if no um, uh, uh, ones are rolled, it stays where it is. So I'll start with the battle group um, rolling 3d6. He will also go to um, the coastal, trying to hunt that pesky submarine. And now the carrier group, 3d6 stays where he is. He is not quite ready to go out. All right, so we actually are going to have some interesting things happening here. Okay, once that's completed, uh, move all task force counters from uh, ready to the war box. Uh, ready for war to the port, and of course the patrol group still is not ready. So that is our naval deployment, and now we'll get to take a look at um, targeting the submarine. So in the search area, uh, as we had done previously, um, the British submarines will now attempt to uh, detect the uh, Argentine submarine. So I'll start with the first one. Um, in the search box, a British submarine detects on a D8. So the first submarine will roll and not detect. The second submarine will roll and not detect. The Argentine submarine will now roll. He detects on a D10, the uh, British submarines. He does not as well. So uh, still a lot of cat and mouse happening there. And that is the end of submarine versus submarine combat. It did not happen. Okay, so now we do British sub versus Argentine surface combatants. And so we'll actually do this one right here. So um, we have a contested box, the coastal box, that has a British submarine that's you know, ready to, to work and um, the Argentine battle group. Um, so we'll now attempt detection. So looking here, a British submarine in the coastal box detecting a surface combatant uh, is a D4. So uh, pretty decent chance here. I'll roll the D4 and come up empty. So uh, the British sub does not uh, find and engage the Argentine surface combatant. It's now the, the Argentine turn, however. Um, so I'll move now to task group versus British submarine. We still have uh, the contested box. Um, and we'll take a look at their combat chart. And so in this case, this is, what's the number on 
this Argentine. He is 79.3. Okay, that's the mid one there. Yep. So he is looking in the coastal box for a submarine. Uh, and so he will get to roll a d6 and he will detect on a one. That's bad. <laughs> okay, I kind of wish that hadn't happened. All right. Um, for each one result, remove one burst submarine from the contested naval patrol box and place it on the combat display. So we'll go ahead and move you to the combat display. This is going to be potentially fairly embarrassing. Just move it over here. I'm not quite sure where he goes, so we'll just do something. Okay. Um, each task group in the contestant box um, Oh, I see. Okay, so um, I can now attack one detected British submarine. For each attack, roll one die as indicated by the attack column on the combat chart. The results are handled uh, in the same way as submarine versus submarine. So this is a thing to note that once a submarine is detected um, by one task group, all task groups may attack. Essentially, uh, they found their quarry. So um, this one um, attacks uh, and isn't terribly effective. Uh, I'll be rolling a d10 here. Let's see, one d10. Oh dear. Okay. Super. Uh, so that roll is a one. And we'll take that then results the same as submarine versus submarine combat. So let me take a look back at submarine versus submarine combat to determine what happens here. The submarine is destroyed. Remove it permanently from the game. Uh, any other uh, number is rolled. The, Argentine, the submarine escapes and um, et cetera. So my gambit here on you know, being in the coastal space did not really pay out to me pay out uh, and uh, a British submarine is has been sunk well crud okay well that happened and uh, I believe let me just check my sequence of play that that might be that for uh, Argentine versus submarine combat All Argentine task groups in the contested naval uh, patrol box are immediately placed off board. Uh, they had a conservative strategy while engaging the British. So he uh, essentially is disengaging, not going to be uh, coming uh, for the main forces. Oh, and I had missed. Interesting. Okay, so uh, given where those markers were, I had missed one of uh, that the... Uh, Argentine submarine uh, was there. So let me real quickly roll that back um, just to have played out the submarine versus submarine combat. Likely a no effect, but the British submarine would have had its detection roll on a D8 of the Argentine submarine and potentially could have engaged it. No, the Argentine a submarine would have done, oh actually I'm sorry, that would have been a D6 in the coastal area. So this is the D6 roll uh, detect the Argentine sub. I did not. The Argentine sub uh, rolls a D8 in the coastal area, um, and he did not detect. Okay, so same uh, same outcomes. <clears throat> All right, so that then completes uh, service group versus British sub. Uh, none of the Navy now is sorted out to engage the British task force, so I'm going to... Um, Um, yeah, Argentine task force and submarines currently occupying a patrol box will attempt to detect the task force. Oh, interesting. I may, uh, perhaps I should have done this last turn on uh, the search box submarines, uh, but we'll go ahead and do this. The detection is abstracted. Uh, to detect the task force, each Argentine submarine or, or task group uh, rolls on the appropriate detection row uh, on the combat chart, cross-referencing the appropriate naval group or submarine with the gray number. Okay, that's the surface number. The successful. Put the Argentine vessel on the combat display. Um, and we'll press on. Okay, so I'll roll back a little bit and 
play out last uh, the turn one Argentine submarine in the search box. So Argentine submarine in the search box looking for a surface combatant would have been a D8. And it was not successful. So now I'll do it again for now for turn two. Uh, the one in the search box is searching for the, the fleet on a D8 and finds it. Okay. So the submarine approaches the fleet. So we'll uh, continue now um, through uh, the, the sequence of play. Um, so we will move uh, the Argentine submarine uh, to somewhere on the combat display. Move you over here. Okay. And. Um, For each British unit currently occupying the task force defense zone, which are none in our case, so I don't have anyone push that far forward, uh, roll a d6 to detect the submarine or task group, and etc. So this, um, I'm not going to get the benefit of that. Uh, so uh, the task defense group does not do anything. I now do an engagement roll, 1d12. Place the unit matching... Uh, Um, and I'll place it in the matching zone. Engagement roll indicates the task force zone does not contain any units. The Argentine vessel will immediately transfer and attack the central task force. Okay, so we're now going to do a roll, and this guy's going to walk in and uh, hit one of the uh, screens that we have. Uh, this is roll um, 13.8, and I'm just going to verify... Yep, I'm just going to verify that we um, don't have uh, an errata on the D12. In this case, it was written as if it was um, actually a D12, so a completely random hit here, which I guess conceptually for the Navy it could be, right? The Navy is um, slow and lumbering and out, and it could be that you get one force to pass the other, uh, and that's fine, whereas the Air Forces are going to be potentially a bit more direct. Um, Let's see here. So the engagement role quite explicitly here does use a 1D12. Um, with the center being a one or a 12. Any other roll, um, we'll do the zone, got it. Okay, so we'll do a 1d12, roll the five. So essentially here, the submarine is approaching here from the south. Okay. So uh, this is, like I was saying, um, you know, the, the procedure is there. It's just, you know, there's, uh, you get yourself working through an edge case in these procedures to figure out, just make sure that you're, Getting them as accurate as you as you can be. Okay, so um, so we rolled our d12. We have um, placed the unit there, and it is now attacking uh, HMS uh, Antrim. Okay. So continuing uh, on with. Uh, Oops. Uh, we'll now actually do the combat. So, uh, combat between British Fleet and Argentine Navy is now conducted. Each zone that has on the task force display that also contains an Argentine unit is contested. For each contested zone, use the following procedure. For each Argentine submarine, randomly select one British vessel from the zone. Uh, then make an attack roll with a 1d6. If it rolls 1, the, it is hit and permanently removed. 1d6. Okay. Submarine does not sink the escort. That's good. Um, so that is done. Once all Argentine attacks have been resolved, the British may attempt to respond. Note that the Argentine uh, naval surface forces are represented collectively. British attacks are resolved in a more abstract manner. Okay, so for each British asset in the contested box that has an attack capability, so we will be able to attack this, select one Argentine target. Um, uh, the Harriers may not attack submarines. No, they don't have an ASW roll. Uh, make an attack roll on the appropriate column from the combat chart, etc. 
rolling a one uh, and we are good. So this is, let's see, what uh, class of unit? This is a, a city. There we go, going against um, subsurface threat. Okay, this guy is about as awful as you get in an ASW roll. I hadn't really considered that, but um, be that as it may. So uh, I'll roll a d10 and I'll get him on a 10, on a one rather. Okay, so I missed uh, my response uh, in my uh, ASW, uh, anti-submarine anti, uh, warfare. So once all the tasks have been resolved, uh, if any vessels on either side have been hit, all uh, Argentine task groups involved in the combat are placed off board and submarines are placed ready for war. If no vessels have been hit, uh, roll in the naval attack resolution chart to discover the outcome of the attack. Okay, so there's a separate chart here that I will find uh, briefly. And we will um, get the result. Okay, so naval attack resolution chart. Roll 2d6 and determine the aftermath. And this is an Argentine um, vessel versus British vessel. So here we go. 2d12. Uh, 10. Task force vessels execute a sudden course change. Argentine units suspected they have been detected. Attack aborted. Argentine task group is placed off board. Subs placed in the ready for war box. So this guy um, goes back to ready for war. And... Um, I will need to spend next turn, so tomorrow he will spend uh, getting ready to sortie and then he'll be able to sortie the next day. Okay, so that was the naval combat, kind of exciting, a little bit awful that I lost a submarine, not happy about that. Kind of curious now, looking at the um, campaign assessment in roll 20 um, to figure out um, what that submarine is going to have cost me. Uh, and in the end, actually, um, the uh, number of zones that I control on the island are what matter. And so uh, this is maybe a little bit less like a Jerry White um, Enemy Coast Ahead type game where you'll have, or, or Skies Above the Reich, uh, where you'll have this whole big complicated denouement process where a lot of things are taken into account. Certainly having lost a submarine here is pretty awful. Uh, and it will make it harder for me to get, uh, as early as this is, to get the task force uh, to where it's going. So that's bad. But, uh, all right. And we're not even done yet, because now the Air Force uh, gets in on the action. We're pretty far out, so uh, the Air Forces are likely not going to be doing all that much. Um, so looking here at uh, Rule K, we will do our scramble roll. The roll is unmodified. Uh, I am looking for uh, a number less than two. If you go someplace else. Yeah. Okay, so um, scramble roll on a D10, looking for a number less than two. I did not get it. So again, no uh, air forces happen, uh, no scrambling happens. As such, uh, we are done with all of that combat. And we uh, now skip down to the intern phase. So I will. Let's see, can, so I will go to intern phase of turn two. Okay. So, uh, Harrier recovery, Get all these guys back. Now that they're back, let's see here, uh, we'll do the refitting. And so, We'll set these guys to ready. And we'll set these guys to arming. Okay, so we have uh, prepared the Harriers. Um, no scramble marker, no naval detection marker, no Harrier recovery, etc., etc. I lost the sub, I don't get it back. No weather marker. Um, actually, I do have a weather marker, let me remove it. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the end of turn two. On to turn three. Weather on a D12. Okay, I rolled a nine. Nine is actually a cloudy day. So uh, we'll bring that over here. 
uh, you'll notice that by uh, actually moving this uh, using the, the command, uh, the scripted action set all of these things that we're looking at. And so we have a plus one scramble modifier. So given the clouds, it's actually slightly less likely that the adversary is going to take off. But it also here gave us a Harrier recovery marker. It's going to um, be slightly more hazardous to do deck operations. So I'm going to be less likely to want to use my Harriers unless I lose them crashing in on the deck. Um, and it's also much less likely that the Argentines are at, going to sortie. So that's the weather impact. Let's see what event we have today. 35, uh, which is a Spanish event. What is this? What's that in the water? Okay, so event 35 gets us to... Intelligence reports Argentine special forces are planning a daring raid on the Royal Navy warships passing through Gibraltar on the way to the war zone. Well, that's pretty awful. My two options. One, massively enhance security on the rock. This includes the imposition of a curfew and the closure of the Gibraltar Spanish border. Spain reacts aggressively to this uh, totalitarian act. International opinion will fall by one. And actually, would be reaching the a point where other things may end up happening. So we'll see about that. Or we can do nothing. Uh, this event remains face up on the board. For every turn, it remains on the board. Each time the task force reinforcement is scheduled to arrive, roll the d10 for each vessel on a roll of one. Notice uh, how many vessels we have remaining to come through. This is going to be pretty bad. Uh, on a roll of a one, um, uh, the reinforcement of any type is destroyed by a limpet mine planted by a four-man naval commando team operating under personal orders from Admiral uh, uh, Ayana. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, on, on Aya. Uh, international opinion falls by one. The international community is alarmed by the spread of the war beyond the South Atlantic. And domestic opinion falls by two. This event is only discarded if and when you make the changes outlined in case A above or when a vessel is sunk. So I can keep this around and make the decision really at any point. Uh, we do note that here that um, the uh, international opinion followed by one will hit us to eight, which appears to be a trigger for a Chilean event. Uh, I'm just going to hop briefly to the rules regarding uh, that track in the war opinion display. Here we go. Um, uh, so at a level of eight, um, uh, support shifts from South America. Britain loses the assistance of Chile for directing and staging covert surveillance, although other support may be provided. Um, so that's interesting. Um, let's see there. So if I flip over this marker, perhaps it's going to tell me a little bit. Oh, no, there's no other side here. Uh, so the rule uh, listed on the other support is 6.2.3. So let me just take a look at that briefly. So this is just me understanding what I'm trading here. Up oh, surveillance and early warnings. Um, All right, so um, for all these air ac um, actions that are going to be happening, we'll have early warning of them, uh, and that will um, help us cue our defenses against them. Uh, there are different assets that provide different levels of coverage, giving us a variety uh, to respond to the threats. The greater the warning, the more efficiently we can deploy our Harriers in the defense of the fleet. Um, we can conduct uh, uh, surveillance in any number of ways. The first is to see if the radar is detected by signals intelligence by a Nimrod aircraft. Um, and we get to uh, do that as long as we have Ascension Island, which is up here. Um, the next um, is um, if we don't have those um, or they were not on station, we can check to see if our SAS team up here uh, has been able to find its its target um, and so there will be a check there as well and if we don't have the Nimrods and the SAS markers not present at the base uh, we then see uh, if the Chilean government allows a surveillance and early warning from its territory and so so the the impact here of allowing international opinion to fall again is 
we won't be getting cueing from the Chileans on attacks uh, coming to us. So for the moment, um, I don't have any recoveries happening or any, any possible forces going for you know, another 10 turns. So I think we let this event ride for a while. Uh, and um, just deal with it when it becomes prudent. Okay. Uh, set rep. We are getting ever more closer, uh, and now we are actually at error alert assessment level three, so it's a bit more likely now, twice as likely as it was previously, um, that uh, the Argentine Air Force is going to come at us, but given the weather, it's actually the same as last turn. Okay. So that was our sit rep. Task force deployment. All right, let me now reconsider life choices. Um, mm -hmm. Reinforcement arrival, we don't have any of those. British submarine deployment. So as it is now, I've got one submarine, and uh, both submarines in search. I think I want to split them and get one more coastal. Um, I, I, I do want to cover both zones. Task force placement. That has worked for me so far. I'm a litany. Having poor anti-submarine warfare uh, in the southern quadrant was regrettable, but I don't think I adjust my air coverage to fix that, so I'll leave it. Uh, cap placement. Um, again, with the cap, I'm slightly less likely to want to do this because anything I scramble, I'm going to have to land and cloudy weather and there's a chance the Harriers will come in. One thing that we'll note about this is that this is a decision-rich solitaire environment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of probability and there's a lot of dice happening here. Um, but uh, as you can see here, I'm actually taking a, quite a bit of time to look over each of these decisions and understand the odds and figure out what my potential gain versus what the cost might be of doing this. You know, if I scramble one aircraft uh, and I have a, a D10 um, probability that something bad is going to happen. Scrambling one aircraft, it's not so bad. I've got 90% chance everything's fine. Uh, if I scramble two, now I only have an 80% chance everything's fine. And if I scramble three, right, I mean, you see where this is going. I only have a 70% chance that everything's fine, roughly. So, um, you know, I don't think I scramble six like I did previously. Um, and we also saw the slight danger of me not having anything in the defense zone. So I think that's going to be something that I rectify. So I am going to push this T-42 uh, into the defense zone. I am going to have one out there. Um, I am going to scramble three Harriers. I'm going to be a bit thinner this time. I'm going to have one over the defense zone. I'm going to have one over... Um, Western approach. We have one over Maine. And we'll just uh, see how that goes. So we have a cap up. Uh, we are not able to do supply introduction, not with the three. Uh, and SES marker placement. Uh, these are still half that come out of trailers, so uh, we're going to keep the SES marker where he is. Okay. So now for the Argentine naval, naval deployment. Uh, let me double check now that I have. Uh, uh, Argentine force and ready for war that I uh, am doing this process appropriately or as appropriate as I can all right all right yes okay this is fine so um, I will roll for the bot the the submarine here in the coastal and this will be our standard 3d4 roll he rolls a single one, which would put him in the coastal were he not there already. Um, and now at the end of this phase, the San Luis, uh, which got had such an exciting turn last time, will now move from where it is to the um, to the port. So uh, he will be available to put to sea next turn. So that's the beginning of the naval deployment. Uh, next, what we're looking at is. Um, Surface group readiness. So let me see if uh, the patrol group is ready. The patrol group will be ready on a D4. It is not. Now let me see if the battle group, if the battle group would be ready on a D6. It is not. Okay. So uh, that is the readiness. And now we'll do the deployment. The surface group deployment uh, was on a 3D6. I do have the carrier group in port ready to go. And so we'll do his 3D6 roll. Coming up with no ones, so he stays in port. 
All right. Sub V sub combat. I do have a single British submarine that in the coastal box that could detect and attack the Argentine submarine. So going to sub V sub combat table, uh, rather for detection. In the coastal areas, the British sub detects the Argentine sub on a D6. No joy. The Argentine sub will detect the British sub on a D8. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is not going well for the, uh, the British submariners. Um, Uh, when rolls have been made for all British submarines, repeat the action for any Argentine submarine remaining in the contested box. Uh, as before, detected British submarines and the Argentine submarines that detected them are placed on the combat display. These were, were in the coastal box. We'll just remember that. Okay. Once the detection rolls have been made, Argentine submarines now attack detected British submarines. Repeat the process outlined above for any detected British submarines, this time using the Argentine submarine row on the combat chart. Um, and so this will be a D10 required for an Argentine sub to sink a British sub. So D10. Okay. Whew. Um, Remove all surviving British submarines from the combat display. Let me just make sure that there's not then a subsequent return fire that happens here. Um, no, it escapes, it disengages, um, etc. Okay, so the way that this attack thing gets resolved, um, remove surviving British submarines from the combat display, paste them back in the appropriate naval patrol boxes rotated so let's see here rotate put you back oops there you go it's just a reminder for me in case um there were something here sorted that i couldn't engage it the submarines are too busy attacking or evading uh, the argentine subs to hunt the task groups rotate them back to normal move all surviving argentine subs from the combat display and paste them in the ready for war box so okay Ready for war. Um, thankfully, that was not as exciting as it could have been. Sub v sub. Uh, we are done with the naval combat for the round as there are no Argentine naval forces um, around. So we're back now on scramble surveillance and early warning, uh, which is to see if uh, the Argentine Air Force is um, up to the challenge yet. We do have a plus one scramble modifier this time from the weather and um, now the air alert assessment is at level three. So I'm gonna roll a D10, add one to it, and I need it to be less than a three. So again, I'm looking for a hard one. There's my hard one. So uh, we actually do have a successful scramble, uh, and we will now begin to go through that sequence of play. So uh, let's see, 515 is the roll that I'm going for, just to make sure that I'm uh, on rails. 5.1.5. Okay, so um, uh, the, t the task force has been detected. Um, look at the active setup card for the uh, air base intelligence analysis to determine which air base will launch the raid. Uh, we'd roll a D10, but the only possible outcome here is uh, Trello. So we have uh, the Canberras uh, coming in to, to us. Okay, finally place a raid marker in the sortie level box on the game board to indicate the current raid number. Remember that the number of the raid marker now matches the current AEA. Today's raid phase ends after the current round. So this is gonna be the first uh, one, and that's uh, really all we can do here. Uh, so uh, that will be it, and it's coming out of trailer. So that is um, raid marker placement. I'm now going to rule 6.2 for the early warning procedure. This is, um, as I had alluded to earlier, on uh, what we'd be doing. So, um, after the airbase targeting roll, we proceed to conduct surveillance. So first I'm gonna see if the Nimrods picked them up. Nimrods being uh, an electronic support aircraft uh, operated out of the Ascension Islands. So, uh, let's see if we get signals intelligence. Um, if, they, if we do, 
Uh, the NIM rods will give us precise information about the raid, uh, which will be used to direct carriers straight to the targets. Um, so roll a d6 on a 1 or a 2, uh, the raid has been detected. So, 1d6. No joy, no signals intelligence. Uh, so I skip those steps. If the NIM rods are not on station, check to see if the SES marker is present at the airbase uh, just selected. And it is. Uh, we do have the SES marker here. If so, the SES team provides the task force with information about the raid's size and composition, but we can't vector the Harriers directly to engage because the SES team just saw them leave. Um, so, um, step one, conduct a squadron attack roll as outlined in 621. So let's see here. We'll examine the squadron attack table. I'll find that table here. Okay. Squadron attack table, there we go. Um, and roll a D10. The result will reveal how many of the Argentine aircraft form into the current raid. This is, uh, and is called the squadron uh, attack roll. There are two possible results uh, based on whether or not there's an embargo or not. Um, and it has not been lifted, so we are still under an embargo. So they're going to be a little bit less boisterous on, on sorting uh, these aircraft. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so I will go ahead and roll this. This is a D10. Okay, that's a roll of a 6, which is a pretty uh, hefty um, result. So this is going to be three of these uh, aircraft, or at least three of these markers, are going to be what come at me. Okay. So... Uh, we've done that. Um, we can now scramble the Harriers to intercept this raid now that we know how many are coming and what they're doing. So this is uh, uh, done in roll 7.1 for Harriers Scramble. Your Harriers can attempt to defend the task force in two ways. One is to form a cap. Um, the second is via scramble in response to early warning intelligence. So scramble placement is handled exactly the same as cap. Um, interesting. So this is going to give me an opportunity, which I may choose or choose not to do, to send Harriers um, uh, from the carrier to do this interception um, well far out from where they are. So here's our scramble to remain in the zone for the duration of the turn or until they engage in incoming aircraft. Okay. <laughs> and I do not have the air targeting roll yet. That will happen after I scramble. And that's the distinction between getting it from the Nimrods or not. So I actually have to scramble the Harriers to intercept the raid. Okay. Um, so in this case, I don't yet know um, where the attack is coming in from. I just have an opportunity to get more uh, aircraft into the air. Um, this will, is going to be followed by a raid targeting roll, which is, um, so it's going to be uh, worthwhile to get to see what that procedure is going to be. That way I know where I want to put these folks. So in the raid targeting roll, that's going to be a 2D6, uh, and comparing that to the locations on the task force display, so we're going to be biased towards the west. And it indicates the target zone of the aircraft planning the attack. All ships in the zone now the target vessels. Um, if the zone contains Harriers, or British surface vessels, um, we put in the air alert marker in the target zone or minus uh, of the zone. Um, if the zone is empty, um, then uh, we go into the, uh, which, which I don't actually have any empty zones. Um, and then we'll be resolving combat there. So, okay. So I get a chance to bring up some more aircraft should I want to. Um, I have one in each of these. I think I'm going to scramble two more to cover my most likely bases, eight and six. I'm not quite sure where this is going to be coming from, so I will take one each from each carrier. 
I guess the uh, role play on that is reasonable. So, covering more of our bases here. We've got a pretty good swarm of Harriers ready to defend us. Okay, so that was the step two of that surveillance step is scrambling uh, the Harriers to intercept the raid, and now we'll do that air targeting roll. Um, Okay. So your targeting roll uh, done here per eight, rolling uh, the d12. I rolled a nine, which is actually the most likely. It was right here in the middle. So uh, it's coming right, uh, right down the 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 middle. So we're gonna place the air alert marker here and we will be able to do uh, some combat. So let me check to see if I do indeed have an air alert marker. Oh, here we go. Is this the air alert marker? Let me find the air alert marker. Uh, often in this uh, manual, there's nice little uh, graphics that will help you find these things. Regrettably, there's no Graphic, um, you know, here we go. Let me just come here to, I thought I had a, a marker tray here in the Vassal module, I guess not. Okay, but we know that it's happening. Um, we know that it's happening in one. Uh, regardless if I can't find the marker. So that's fine. Okay, so it's happening here uh, in uh, the Western Approach. Uh, and we're able to now continue on now that we know have done the early warning uh, to air-to-air -air combat. There is a Harrier in this zone, so um, uh, there is a Harrier in this zone. So we'll move on to Rule Nine: air-to-air -air combat. Um, the this section of rules gives us a little bit of. Oh, actually, let me grab these guys while we're here. All right, bring them all down here for the moment. Okay, uh, so we have four Argentine Air Force boxes um, uh, identified by the Argentine Rondel. Uh, two Fleet Air Arm boxes identified by my Fleet Air Arm Rondel. And one Royal Navy box. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, one uh, Royal Navy box identified by the White Ensign. So this is going to be from the Royal Navy. One Argentine Army box identified by the National Flag. Um, one British Army box, identified by the Union Jack, and then one Naval Range box uh, right here. Uh, literally, the words in the rule book are identified by the funny little range-looking thing. That's that's what's in, in the rule book. Um, okay, so we'll use them for different purposes. Uh, here, we're going to use them for the air combat. So, air combat is conducted in the following way. Look to see which type of Argentine aircraft is engaged in the attack of the task force, depending on the aircraft type. Roll the following target lock die for each attack hacking aircraft. And so in this case, I've got uh, the Canberras. Um, and so for the Canberras, I'm going to roll a D4. This represents the British attempts to get their weapon systems fixed on the incoming Argentine aircraft. Um, after the first roll, place the target lock marker equivalent to the number just rolled in the um, target lock box on the combat display just below the first Argentine Air Force box, then the first Argentine aircraft and the Argentine Air Force box itself. If there are other Argentine aircraft present, place subsequent target lock markers on Argentine aircraft counters in the second, third, and fourth boxes. Okay. So let's just run through this literally um, uh, and, and, and procedurally. So Roll the following target lock die for each attacking aircraft. And so I will roll a D4 for each of them. Sequentially, D4s, uh, there are three. Okay, three, three, and four. Uh, so this is the target lock roll representing our attempts to get the weapons fixed on them. After the first roll, place the target lock marker equivalent to the number just rolled. So 
Um, here's a target lock of three, okay? Um, in the target lock box at the center, I'm sorry, in the target lock box on the combat display. Okay, there we go. So let me spread these guys out here a little bit. Three, three, and here, four. There are other Argentine aircraft present. Place subsequent target lock and Argentine aircraft cameras in the second, third, and fourth Argentine Air Force uh, in target lock boxes. So here's four. So I've got these two here in target lock three and this one here in target lock four. The result um, is the same for one or more. Simply place these counters in the same box in the single target lock marker in the box below. Okay, so here we go on the target locks. Each Harrier in the target zone, and we had one Harrier, um, may now open fire on their targets. Okay. Uh, note the value on the dice rolled in the following roll are identical to those just rolled during the Argentine aircraft placement. So if the international opinion is three or more, and it is, um, then we have access to the AIM-9L Sidewinder, which was an all-aspect missile. Roll two dice for each Harrier engaging. If the task force has lost it, we roll just one die. The sole exception is, is the squadron leaders who are marked in encounters with their squadron emblem. They may always fire two dice. Okay. The die roll is identical to, identical to that roll of the target lock. Um, then... Um, The, the die rolled is identical to that rolled on the target lock above, um, i.e. the numbers next to the target lock uh, aircraft on the combat chart. Find the appropriate combat chart here. I see. So, the die I will roll versus a Canberra is a D4. All right. Each die roll that matches the target lock marker destroys it or forces it to abort. All of the aircraft, uh, all of the aircraft in that box. Okay. Flip each aircraft to the reverse, destroy its sign. The sign wires have found their targets. Um, all right. So, um, and now if and only if a pair of carriers from the same flight are attacking, they have managed to bounce the Argentines. In this case, immediately remove all destroyed and or boarded Argentine aircraft from the combat display and return them to their respective airbase, that they do not get a chance to fight back. Okay, so I guess we'll just, um, now that we've uh, skimmed over that, uh, we will um, uh, step through that um, step by step to make sure that we got it right. Um, so we have the Harrier target lock acquisition rules. We have the three on the first pair and the four on the second one. We have the Harrier firing roll, um, which is roll 922. Okay. And in this case, uh, each Harrier may open fire on their targets, and we get to roll two dice for this Harrier um, due to the, having the all aspect missiles. So I'll be rolling 2d4. So we'll do that. Okay. I rolled a 1 and a 2. I think those are the only two numbers I didn't want to roll. <laughs> Uh, if the um, and and we rolled the D4 since we were attacking the Canberras. Each die that matches the target lock marker destroys or aborts all of them. So uh, in this case, my one lone Harrier didn't do bupkis for me. Okay. Now, if there are surviving Argentine Dagger or Mirages, they will attempt to um, target the Harriers. Um, and in this case, there are not. Okay. Um, now the uh, so that was rule nine point three, uh, which gets us uh, through uh, the Argentine target lock acquisition roll. And now we have the Argentine firing roll. Okay, and they, and again these are not going to be firing back. So um, a, a lot of ineffective missile firing. Um, uh, for us uh, entirely. So any surviving Argentine aircraft are now proceed to the surface to air combat segment. Having evaded the Harrier patrols, the surviving Argentine aircraft are closing in on their targets. Task Force must now rely on ship-based defenses uh, as they've evaded our patrols and this is awful. Um, so um, I'll just note here that uh, now that we have 
finished uh, this segment that the um, the Harrier gets moved to the flown box. Okay. Um, but these guys are still out here. And this is this is not good. Uh, so we are now going to go from the air to air combat segment uh, to the uh, surface air combat segment. And uh, Bobby Dodge, I see that you're there. Hello, thanks for joining us. Um, hopefully you've uh, you know, been watching for a little bit and see what we've been doing. We're just working through uh, the uh, air raid sequence of play right now um, and kind of stepping through it. And again, what you find that the systems here aren't that terribly difficult. You just have to stop, play through them, um, and pay attention to the verbiage and the rules, uh, and then subsequent uh, interactions with uh, that uh, get to be fairly intuitive. Um, okay, so now uh, surface to air combat is conducted, um, and this is uh, rule section N. So let's see here. Uh, surface to air combat procedure, the starting range. At the start of the combat round, place the 30 mile range marker in the naval box. All right, so we are working at 30 miles. Uh, on the combat display, this indicates the range of the attacking aircraft from the target vessels. You know, I suppose I actually have to see here if, uh, make sure I get the target vessels where they should be. All right. To activate their defenses, at least one of the target vessels must first secure a radar lock uh, on the incoming aircraft. At the start of each combat round, you must choose one vessel to attempt this. Logically choose the vessel possessing the most effective radar system as indicated by the radar lock number. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll see, uh, let's see here. In the Western approach, I had two, no, yeah, I had two, a, a T-42 and a T-41. Uh, 21, the um, 42 has a better radar, so I'll roll a D10. Um, I have to roll equal to or less than a six. All right, four, okay. So I do have uh, a radar lock. That That uh, is now a thing that I have. Radar lock has been achieved. All Royal Navy vessels that have not already fired are now free to engage the attackers. Remember, only one vessel has to achieve a radar lock for all vessels to fire their weapons. Uh, I do have two vessels here, T-42 and T-21. Let me just bring them down to the combat display. That way everyone's kind of in the same boat. The 42 uh, has the Sea Dart system, which is actually fairly capable. Uh, and the 21 has the C-CAT system, which is more of a close-in system. So if I flip these, does it have any info? Yeah, there we go. So I guess, all right. <clears throat> so C-DART and C-CAT. And so the process here is going to be for me, uh, now that we have the target lock, Acquisition, I'm sorry, now that we have the radar lock, uh, we're now going to proceed potentially to the target lock step. Um, let's see, so we've got the radar lock. So, at the, um, da, 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 da. We'll get to decide which systems are run just trying to engage. At the start of each combat round, we must decide which vessels will engage. Examining the missile system displays, identify which missile systems are carried on the vessels. Each system has a range indicator. Um, okay, so for firing missiles, each missile can only fire once per raid, not once per combat round. So we get one shot at this. You must successfully, carefully weigh when each ship can engage uh, the attacking aircraft in a given combat round. So we must first secure target lock in the same manner that we did with the air-to-air -air systems. Looking at the number located on the relevant range indicator for each missile system, so we intend to fire this round, we'll now roll one die, um, equivalent to the lowest of those numbers, i.e. Uh, if it's four, we'd roll d4s. 
uh, and assign those. When the target lock die uh, has been selected, you roll one die for each attacking Argentine aircraft and place those on the combat display, etc. Now the target lock numbers have been secured, the time has arrived for the Royal Navy to engage the attackers in each firing vessel. Uh, you should roll one die at the same range value as the range indicator um, for the weapon system carried on the ship. Okay, so that was just kind of a summary. We're going to kind of do the same thing that we did for air. Um, we'll note here that the Sea Cat and the Sea Dart are both systems that are effective at 10 miles. Um, the Sea Dart uh, is a D4 at 10 miles, and the Sea Cat is a D8. Um, so I have a very long uh, italicized note here on an example of play on, after firing these missiles. Um, but um, Uh, so we'll note though that if I choose not to engage here at 30 miles, um, I can, let's see here, this goes back to step one, which is a target log. Okay, so, so I, I have the, um, a radar lock. I, I've got them coming in and I can kind of just let this cycle to get to the range that I want to engage. I'm just going to kind of keep running through here and going, do I want to fire? Do I want to fire? So that even though the sea dart has a max range of 30 miles on a D8, it's, it's going to be more effective closer in at 10 miles. So um, I think I'm going to do this um, quite possibly in um, two uh, um, uh, in two vols. One's going to be a, a 10 mile vol and the other one might be a point blank one mile vol. I just got to wonder though with these bombers, um, you know, again, you want to look ahead here ever so briefly uh, to see if you're about to walk into a trap with um, uh, these, uh, these bombers being able to reach you. The Exocet is a standoff weapon. Uh, and I want to make sure I engage these guys far enough away where they're not a threat. Okay, that's that's the other thing you really want to pay attention to. So, um, real quickly, looking at exit sets. Um, the exit sets were carried by the Entenard, not the Gambera. So I don't have to worry about that. Uh, and so now I'm just going to do the air-to-surface, standard air-to-surface combat with the Gambera. Um, and it looks like a fairly standard once they get in uh, and are on top of their target, they'll be doing some, some close end bombing. So, okay, so I want to let the, the range cycle down from 30 miles down to 10 miles. And we are going to uh, hold until 10 miles and we'll then do the sea dart on the entire set. We'll do one set of sea darts at 10 miles, then at one mile, we'll get the sea cats in to do the close end. So uh, here out of 10 miles, the sea darts all loose. Um, I will re-roll target locks for all these guys uh, and we'll get, uh, get them. So again, uh, I've got three D4 uh, for my target locks. One, one, three. Okay. And then three. All right, and so I will simply, f uh, yeah, I will simply fire the sea dart on this one. So uh, stepping through the uh, surface to air combat, um, step three, um, uh, I roll one die of the same uh, value as the range indicator displayed on the weapon system carried by the firing ship. Well, let's do it. So we're going to go ahead and roll uh, the C dart D4. And I rolled a three, which actually now uh, destroys slash aborts um, uh, this aircraft. And we will move him back to his base. 
um, doing this by the letter of the law. Let's see here. Um, destroys or aborts all of the aircraft in the box above. Immediately remove the counters of the destroyed aircraft uh, and return them to their respective air bases. Okay. So uh, back to his base. He is ineffective. I still have these two guys, um, but they are not engaged. Um, I, I had decided not to engage with the sea cats. So uh, stepping in now to the final range increment at one mile. Um, the sea cats are coming in. Uh, I'll roll 2d6 for these guys to figure out what their numbers are. They're both two. This is going to be bad. All right, now I'm going to roll a single d6 uh, to engage and hope I roll a two because otherwise nothing's happening. And it's a six. Okay, so uh, two of these bombers make it all the way through. Uh, surface to air combat has been completed. Uh, we've done the combat loss removal. Um, and we finished that phase. So now we're on the standard bomb run, which is the next section of the rules, rules 11. Okay, so the way that this bomb run is gonna work is gonna do a target selection draw. Draw one surface vessel um, randomly. So uh, you notice that I had two vessels uh, here that could have been um, chosen by the bombers. Um, uh, one is the frigate, one's the destroyer. So I will bring up the random draw cup. I will put both in there and I will draw one randomly, I think. There we go. All right, so random draw here. It is the frigate that is targeted. Okay. This is the target for the current attack. If the ship draws the last one in the container, then all the remaining aircraft will attack that one. If there's only one remaining ship uh, uh, attacking the aircraft, then... Um, all right, uh, Argentine aircraft now engage our targets. Depending on the type of the attacker, roll the following die and a, a result of one yields a hit. So one thing I just want to verify here, I see, yes. So this will be done one aircraft at a time. So um, the first uh, Canberra is going to be attacking uh, the arrow. Uh, and as a Canberra, he will hit on a D12. Let me move that. Air service. All right. So he'll hit on D12. He misses. Okay. Any aircraft that just attacked or returned to their airbase. So he has done his duty. Go. Um, any surviving vessel that had just been bombed is now returned to the task force display, not the container and uh, as uh, marked by the air alert marker. So he is now having uh, suffered his attack is back here. Got it. Um, I'll now pull from the cup the target of the other bomber and no surprise. Uh, so I guess the doctrine here is one for one. And again, uh, the Canberra is going to hit on a D12. All right. Um, I suppose now the thing that may have been the most risky part of this is taking off and recovering my Harriers because whole lot of nothing happened there. And that I'm okay with. Okay, so that's the end of combat. We're now at the end of the turn. So I will skip all the way to the end turn phase. And... We'll go through that sequence. So the Harrier recovery. So now Harrier recovery is not is not quite as trivial. So let me go ahead and bring up rule 7.3 real quick to make sure that we uh, get this correct. Um, Under certain marginal weather conditions, returning to the deck in the carrier could prove especially hazardous. To reflect this, if it's cloudy or worse, a separate recovery is rolled. is made each time an individual Harrier is gone to the flown box, immediately after all relevant Harriers have been placed there. The value of the die rolled will be dependent on the weather, etc. If one is rolled, the, carrier, the Harrier is lost permanently. 
So um, all of these Harriers that scrambled now must land. And they are now in their flown boxes. All the ones that are in the flown boxes now get uh, a D10. And on a roll of a one, they go away. So I'll start with uh, from Invincible Gold 3 here, rolling his D10. Okay, that is not a one. Um, now I'll go through um, Black Leader. Uh, let's see, let's reorder the stack. Uh, it'll be. Uh, Black leader will be the first one, and then I'll do tartan one, two, and three. So this will just be in sequence. That way I can roll a whole bunch of these. So black leader, actually I'll roll 40, 10. Sequence will be black leader, and then tartans one through three. Whew, okay. Um, no bad day. So everyone recovers just fine, uh, and we can now uh, uh, move the ones that had been arming to where they uh, are. And I can now move uh, uh, those to arming. Okay, so um, a lot of potential for badness, and thankfully no badness happened. Um, we'll remove the scramble marker, the naval detection, none of those things happen. All this, all this will uh, clean up on the cleanup step when I remove the yeah, weather marker. I should at least, yep, okay. I'll remove the sortie. Perfect. All right, so we've done Harrier recovery. We've done Harrier refitting. We've removed all the various markers. Um, I get to flip this submarine back right set up. And um, we've removed the weather marker. Okay, so that is the end of turn three. Our, so this is starting to get interesting. Um, we note that I still have the uh, threat uh, near Gibraltar. I'm happy to let that threat remain for the moment because I do not want to lose my Chilean warning um, just yet. So I've advanced the turn marker. Uh, now we're getting to the weather on the D12. Okay, I rolled a 10. That's even worse weather. Uh, so if I just do this, uh, okay. Um, So now it's foggy weather, which is plus one on the scramble roll. Um, I get the Harrier recovery, and I now have a detection modifier, actually, which is uh, the carrier group detection is degraded. Uh, you'll notice here that we actually have, oh, here's the air alert. Found it. <laughs> um, that we have um, all naval group detection is degraded, or the carrier group detection is degraded, or... Um, enhanced, and so this will affect uh, detection rolls. Uh, just due to weather here, uh, we're going to have uh, problems. Uh, uh, certain Argentine forces are going to have problems uh, detecting based on the weather. Okay, so uh, we've got our weather. The fog has set in. Seems like a great part of the world to have a conflict. Uh, weather's just awful. No wonder the British liked it. Okay, um, so that was our weather. Now we'll do our event draw. We're keeping event 35, that's still a thing, but I'm now also going to have event 34. Uh, U.S. event. I thought we won the War of Independence, Senator. Oh dear, hopefully the U.S. doesn't back out of this. Okay, so 34. If the international opinion is zero, discard and draw another. U.S. Congress becomes alarmed when a CBS news crew reveals the extent of the logistical support being provided to the task force. You may A. Pressure the White House to resist the growing domestic concern about the United States' role in the conflict. President Reagan pledges his support, but opposition continues to grow. International opinion falls by two. Well, that would be terrible. Or offer to reduce the demands being placed on U.S. resources. Take two reinforcements of your choice, any vessel except troops, submarines, or support ships, and remove them permanently from the game. If there are no reinforcements less, remove any two active units. Okay, so I can have international opinion fall by two, which will certainly cost me my Chilean um, support. Uh, that, that will fall through. Or I can lose two of my reinforcements. Let's see, I cannot sacrifice... Um, Troop, submarine, or support ships. So, like, for instance, all these have to stay. 
I can lose a handful of these um, frigates or destroyers coming later. Um, which ones of these are just completely awful? Um, that sea slug missile is not very good. So I'm looking at potentially if there's any city class um, ships. Uh, those might be good targets to you know not worry about. Um, regrettably, I'm not actually seeing any of those. Um, I'm seeing a lot of things that I, you know, really do kind of want to have. Um, all right. Well, if I can't get rid of a city, sea darts entirely capable. Sea cat slightly less capable. T21, I can stand to lose, live without. Uh, potentially. So I could take HMS Active and HMS Avenger and just not use them. And I think that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so there is Active. Oops. I'll move them over here. There's Active. There's Avenger. And in the end, since um, we decided not to pressure the U.S. administration into continuing to support these efforts um, that we had to make up for that in other ways. And, and the net result was that there were then uh, two more force, uh, ships that weren't available uh, to steam. Okay. Well, very few of these events are good. <laughs> in fact, I'm not sure if any of them are. They're just all bad news. Okay, new set rep card. Get rid of three, go to four. Um, I think uh, if it wasn't for the awful weather, um, interdiction might be in order, but let's see here. Okay. Um, we're still at error alert assessment level three. Um, so on uh, a modified two or lower, uh, the Argentines would uh, find us. There is now a possibility that the forces, uh, the Exocet carrying forces um, from Rio Grande uh, would sortie, and but they're still only going to have um, one uh, raid coming. It's still a little bit far out, and we note that introduct in interdiction is now possible. All right, so we've done. The sit rep. Well, let's consider our deployment. Um, no reinforcements. Submarines. None but nobody sunk. I'm happy where they are. Task force display. Again, I'm still fairly happy with where these folks are. Don't want to do any movement. Um, cap placement. I think I want to continue to hedge here and simply have. Um, one uh, and and simply have um, one squadron uh, sortie and not both. So let me grab at um, this uh, set here from the Hermes, and uh, like I did before, I'll put one uh, in the defense zone, one west, and one over the task force. I just don't want to have to recover these guys if bad things happen. Um, uh, this is the point that I could do supply interdiction. Um, just to entertain that, let's look at rule 15 briefly uh, to figure out what that would entail. And uh, let's see here. Um, so the Argenti Argentine supply marker is currently at 14 on the uh, track. So potentially a lot of supply. At the start of any turn, uh, four or above, I may attempt to interdict that supply. If attempting to interdict, simply take up the five Harriers from one or both of the ready boxes on the Sea Harrier display, place them on the combat display. They have been tasked with intercepting the incoming uh, supply flights. Now roll a D6 for each Harrier. Um, on one or two, that supply mission has been successfully intercepted. Place the intercepting Harriers in their flown boxes uh, and retreat the supply marker one space on the turn track, or if it's on space one, remove it from the board. If no ones or twos were rolled, the supply fight has snuck through. Um, the supply marker remains in its space on the turn track. 
I'll place all intercepting Harriers in the flown boxes and proceed with the game. So this allows me to work down um, the supply. There's then a, a further note here that uh, the impact of supply, again with nonlinearities in this rule book, um, to figure out why you care about supply, it's rule 12 to 10. So why not? We're in the interest of making deliberate choices here and not just randomly deciding things to do. Um, 12 to 10 is actually quite a ways in here. Uh, and the, how the landings happen in ground combat preparation. Um, but it appears that, um, that there's uh, a process by which um, there's uh, a preparation and both sides get ready for the ground forces to fight one another. The very last step of that is look to see if the supply marker is currently in, the, uh, in place on the turn track. If it is, retreat at one space, i.e. the Argentines are consuming their supply. Um, if the supply marker has been removed, then the Argentine units are out of supply. And the impact of this is um, they are all flipped to their reverse out of supply side and are using a less effective combat factor. Okay, so the name of the game here is to control uh, a section of the island and to successfully win the ground combat game. We are going to want the... Uh, uh, to, to interdict these supplies. That's going to, that's the, you know, the army marches on its stomach, right? And if these folks don't have beans, bullets, or um, band-aids, they're, they're not going to be able to, to fight effectively. So I do want to have an eye towards this. However, I, I do have an eye uh, also that uh, the weather is suboptimal. Uh, I'm going to have much better luck most other times, actually. The only, nine and above gives me problematic uh, Harrier um, operations. So I, I think I want to, I don't want to do it in bad weather. I don't think I do the interdiction missions while I've got um, this early uh, and, and could risk my Harriers. So I'm going I'm to hold on to those for now and not do uh, the cast mission. So since I'm skipping the, ca the, the cast, inter uh, I'm sorry, not the cast, but the uh, interdiction mission. So since I'm not interdicting supply, I uh, can place my SAS marker um, Trello is still the one that um, is most likely to happen, so I'm going to leave the SAS there, although, of course, the exosets uh, from Rio Grande would be pretty problematic. Okay, so that is uh, deployment. We're pretty happy there. Now we'll do the Argentine Navy. They have nothing currently on the board, so what we're going to do first is we're going to look at the submarines, and we'll do their deployment. I've got one submarine able to put to sea, the San Luis, so 3D4 there, and he goes straight to uh, the search box. He's pretty far out here. Okay, so we've got him in the search box. We have then automatically uh, his buddy goes uh, in port. Next we do the surface group readiness. I figure out which of these folks are ready to go. I uh, patrol and battle. Uh, the patrol is not ready and the battle is not ready. So. Uh, now it's simply a question of if the carrier group sort uh, puts to sea. So I have 3D6, it does not. The carrier group, again, is happy to stay where it is. Which brings us now finally to sub v sub combat. So in the search zone, my, the British sub detects uh, the Argentine sub on a D8. It did not. In the search zone, the Argentine sub detects the British sub on a D10. It does not. So a whole lot of nothing happening there. And so that was sub v sub combat. Um, and so now we go into the Argentine Navy versus the British task force segment. Since the sub that slipped all the way out here um, is uh, uh, potentially able to find and engage the, the task force. Uh, and Harriet. So, um, Argentine Navy versus Task Force. This is uh, starting on rule 13.8. Essentially, what we're going to have is we're going to have a search roll to see if the sub finds the task force. It won't be imp impeded by weather. Um, okay. So, that sub looking for a task force from the search box 
uh, detects on a D8, and it does not. So, um, so I'm just reading what happens here. If the roll is successful, do that. Da, da, da. Yeah, so so since that detection was not successful, I, I believe we just completely move on with life. Um, so we, uh, which we will. Okay, so no naval combat. Uh, we're now gonna look at um, the potential here for air combat. So starting with the scramble, we will do the scramble roll. Um, modifiers plus one. Um, uh, air uh, alert assessment is three, so this is going to be a D10 at plus one. Uh, that is a modified four, and so uh, the Argentines don't have enough info uh, to send out uh, anything, and so we are now actually all the way done uh, and are going to go to our end turn. Okay, turns get a lot quicker when no one finds each other. Uh, so at the end of the turn on the fourth, We'll run through this. Uh, all of the Harriers recover. And uh, let's see here, control G, got it. I should have uh, three, yes, okay. Um, we'll do this as red one, two, and three on their recovery rolls uh, since I still do have weather. Everyone's fine. So uh, let me make you ready. And now we'll put you to arming. And we are uh, done with the Harriers. Um, everything else can just be ready by me returning this. Okay, everything else got reset. So that is the end of turn three, on to turn four. I'm sorry, that was the end of turn four, on to turn five. And nothing out of that exoset marker, so that's fine. All right, turn five. Let's do our weather, D12 here. Can I have any crummier weather, please? Um, that 11 is about as bad as the weather's going to get, uh, which is going to be overcast. So we'll go ahead and take that. Um, the scramble modifier is a plus two. Um, uh, the Harrier Ops is now on an eight. And um, all detections by Argentine forces are uh, degraded. Um, potentially even subsurface. Let, let's see, what is what is this listed as? Um, all naval group detection, so potentially not subsurface. We will uh, press on. Okay, so uh, that's the weather. Bad weather there. Um, event draw. 18. Okay, pull that up. Gentlemen, we have a war to fight. Okay. Operational differences develop between senior officers on the two British aircraft carriers concerning tasking of flying operations. You may A, order Rear Admiral uh, Woodward to issue a formal rebuke to the officers, warning them that their actions are undermining the air defense ca uh, capability of the task force. Domestic opinion, uh, domestic opinion falls by one after news of this issue leaks to the media. Or do nothing. This event card remains face up on the board. For each turn, it remains on the board. Sea Harriers from only one carrier may fly air operations of any type during each turn. And carrier use may alternate from turn to turn. This event may also be discarded if and when you issue a warning outline in case A. So I have pretty strong domestic opinion. I could just you know, tell these guys to knock it off and, and do that. Um, I, I also have pretty much everybody from uh, Invincible ready to go. So I'm actually going to, again, punt on the issue and not commit a resource that I don't absolutely have to. Um, and so I will simply sortie from Invincible this turn and then next turn I'll go from Hermes. So Bobby, if you have an opinion on, opinion on that, I'd love to hear it. Um, but unless you uh, uh, disagree, that's what we're doing.
All right. Uh, the task force will. Oh boy, do I? So here, so here's potentially one reason to not press further in and to not flip up another situation report card. Like I mentioned, I've got several days that I can dwell before I run into the scheduled um, uh, launching of the task force. I don't necessarily want to run in all the way with minimal task force into heavy, uh, increasingly heavy air defenses without something to show for it. Um, uh, so, um, if I flip a card, I'm getting closer and potentially, um, going to start to be subject to increasing, uh, levels of air interception as it is at a plus two, is it a plus two or a plus one? It's a plus two on the air combat display. Um, at a plus two, uh, there's absolutely no way for the, uh, Argentine air force to come at me. So I don't need to worry about Harrier ops. Um, if I sit tight with the weather, um, I'm actually um, f comfortable uh, on, on the fact that I don't need to risk the Harriers uh, for defense of the uh, uh, for the defense of the battle group. Um, and honestly, I might do that. I might just pause one, give my following forces a moment to to uh, collect, um, maybe risk a small. Um, effort against uh, their air supply um, and and sit out here against the Navy. Um, I think that's maybe what I do. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take the sit rep card. Uh, that is an optional step. Uh, we're going to do task force deployment here. And so this is uh, what I was getting at with, um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I don't need to do a cap. So task force deployment, I get no reinforcements. Submarines are where I want them. Um, Task force display is how I want it. I am not going to do a cap because I am not worried about um, I, 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 the, their navies already not out at sea. So um, nothing, not terribly worried about them and I'm not worried about their air force this turn. Um, so I'm not going to do a cap. I will do um, two supply, uh, I will send two Harriers on a supply interdiction mission. I, I think that's an appropriate balance of risk. Um, and so we'll do that following the rule uh, section 15 uh, for this. So um, I'll take two uh, Harriers from the display. I'll take two of them here from gold. I'll take gold. Um, actually, i tell you what, I'll take one uh, from gold and one from Trident. There we go. And these guys will fly um, the interdiction mission. Um, now I'll roll 1d6 for each Harrier. So this will be 2d6. I rolled a one. So if any of the dice rolled are a one or two, the submission was effective and I have decremented the Argentine supply by one. Perfect. So that was a success. Um, and um, I put them in their flown boxes now. Uh, and at the end of the turn here, we'll have to recover those, but we'll, we'll live with that. Okay, uh, so that was fine. Um, and SAS will stay where they are. I get, nobody's going to take off, so it's fine. Argentine naval deployment. All right, so this may actually happen. I'll, I'll start with the submarines that is currently to sea, and it will roll its 3D4 and it will fall back to the coastal area, rolling a single one. Um, the one that is in port will roll its 3d4 and also go to the coastal area. Okay, so I've got two Argentine subs in the coastal area um, and one of my subs. Uh, the surface group readiness, let me see if any of these folks decide that they're ready to uh, sortie. Uh, the patrol on a 1d4, yes, Control gets ready, and the battle on a 1d6. No. All right, and uh, finally here, um, surface group deployment. I can see if the carrier is ready to go. He'll roll 3d6. He is ready to go. The carrier comes out here also to the coastal area. Well, this is just a busy day for this. So, um, so there's a lot of Argentine Navy in their territorial waters near their shore, um, potentially a threat to the task force as it gets closer. Um, bad weather here, so I'm, I'm not anticipating that the carrier's 
it's going to be too much risk, but um, if I can get that carrier, that would be great with my submarine. So we've done that. All right. So we'll now move on to the uh, naval combat segment. Uh, the submarines are largely um, unaffected by the overcastness, which is um, to be expected. So looking at the naval rules uh, for all of this, um, I'm just looking at for when I flip over um, uh, uh, my, my submarine. It's actually after a successful detection and, and um, it's combat. So I'll go ahead and try to do a submarine detection. And we will uh, just uh, do this. In coastal waters, um, British submarines detect... Um, their adversary on a six, on a D6. It did not. So now I go into um, the uh, Argentine submarines. Um, uh, repeat the process for any Argentine submarine remaining in the contested box as before the detected version submarines uh, are placed in the combat to play. So each Argentine submarine in the coastal area um, Detects on an eight. So I'll roll uh, a D8 for the first one. I'll roll a D8 for the second one. Okay, so none of the subs have found one another. British sub versus Argentine surface combat. So this is gonna follow very much the same um, rule set here. Um, uh, but interestingly, we may have some rules of engagement. So unrotated British submarines in a contested box with the Argentine task group may now attempt a detection roll. Make one roll for each sub. Um, uh, in this case, it's going to be a D4. Choosing uh, in advance uh, which task group I'm trying to hunt for. All right, so I'll roll my D4, see if I get a detection. I do not. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on with that. Um, I, I believe we'll move on with that. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay. Um, so uh, given that the submarine didn't engage the task group, um, we are now doing the Argentine uh, service group versus the British subs. There's a chance that they found us. So uh, in this coastal box, this is the, let's see, 79.1. Um, this group detects uh, on an eight. Kind of has some of the, you know, most, uh, well, maybe it detects on an eight. Let me see if that's actually shifted by weather. Because uh, effectively, these are needing to operate uh, in this weather. They are needing to maybe do some helicopters to do some anti-sub warfare, etc. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are not going to adjust that detection since it's not explicitly stated here uh, that it affects the submarine detections. So uh, we'll go ahead and... Although, all naval group detection. So I'm going to go ahead and degrade it. So it's going to go down from a um, an 8, a D8 to a D10. Uh, and so this is his detection of the... Submarine, no joy. And Argentine Navy versus the British Task Force now. So does this carrier group um, detect the fleet? So it'll attempt to directly detect the, ta uh, the task force. Roll the appropriate detection roll in the combat chart, cross-referencing the naval group, etc. Roll is successful, place them... Uh, in okay, so um, for surface combatants, 
there's actually, all right, the detection roll from Coastal is a D8. And again, that will be uh, decremented to a D10. And actually, I misrolled that previously. So to detect a sub, it was a D6 decremented to a D8. Let me do that right now for the sub detection. Okay, and now it's a D8 decremented to a D10 for the surface uh, detection. Okay, so nobody has found anyone else. <laughs> Um, simply didn't happen. Um, so that did not happen. And now uh, we get to the air. Uh, I could do the die roll here, but we're at plus two on the scramble modifier. Um, minimum roll is a one. Um, I, I, at least I'm fairly certain that in this game, a zero is not a zero. Um, but instead, yeah, a result of zero is always read as a 10. Okay, so I roll a one, the smallest number I can roll, I add two to a three. Uh, I don't get any scrambles, so we're gonna skip right to the end stage. So that turn, um, going here to the end stage, end of turn, save. Okay, uh, and we'll run through this uh, end step. So uh, here are your recovery, we've I'm pretty much already done, um, but I will need to roll two D8 to look for um, problems. No problems, okay. Uh, and so now we'll get these guys going back to um, their carriers and being ready to go. That's the end of the Harriers. Let me uh, return the weather marker. Okay, and that reset everything that it needed to reset. And that's the end of uh, turn five. So we'll go, I'll go ahead, I think I got time to squeeze in one more turn. I'll try and get turn six done and we'll call that, uh, we'll call that an evening. Um, so uh, advance the turn marker, weather. I can't keep having awful weather, six. Six is not awful weather. I can deal with a six. Okay, so gray is absolutely nothing changes. So I'm gonna go ahead and press in um, on my uh, set rep when we get to that stage but I do get another event. The hits just keep on coming. Okay, 42 is the event, which is those uh, white shawl pin pushers. Oh dear. What have the staff officers done now? Here we go. Um, the fleet receives an urgent message from Sync Fleet requesting clarification of the rules of engagement. The player must make uh, a WOD roll, 4.4. If the roll is less than or equal to the current WOD level, the fleet receives approval to proceed. Discard this event. If it's greater than, hold the current position. The order has been received from Admiralty. The player does not draw a set rep card this turn. Instead, they retain etc. Okay, well, let's read rule 4.4 and figure out what the heck this WOD roll is. Okay, uh, so four point, it's an opinion. All right, um, on a number of occasions during the game, you may be called to make a war opinion display roll. This number is always consulted using a D10. Before making this roll, you must first work out the current overall WOD level. This is done by simply averaging the current international and domestic opinions. So for me, that is currently nine and a half. Uh, rounding down, so nine. Um, okay, so my the WOD level is nine. Uh, so uh, we have lots of support here. Um, and so if I roll a nine or less on a D10, we are good to, oh my God. <laughs> of course. Of course, if we roll the nine or less, we could press on and move in. However, the Admiralty is Wanting to clarify, the player does not draw a set rep card this turn. Instead, we keep the existing set rep card. Um, uh, um, the changing diplomatic and domestic political situation has led the politicians to order a temporary halt in the advance of the task force. The flea is to maintain its current position. Uh, well, that's frustrating. I did that deliberately last turn because of the weather, and now I'm still stuck here. Um, no set rep cards. We're still where we are. Now I have task force deployment. So uh, now I will be doing... Uh, okay. Uh, reinforcement arrival, none. British submarine placement. I still like one each. Do I still have one each? I do. And actually... Um, hmm. I'm wondering if I push my other submarine up. Um, I'll note that 
Um, the one thing that that um, I think will be helping us uh, for um, engaging the Argentine Navy in the coastal area is that the Argentine Navy did sink a submarine, um, which is uh, quite hostile. Now, granted, they sank it in the coastal waterways, but um, so as far as rules of engagement goes, um, if no British vessels or Argentine vessels have been sunk so far, then prior to engaging task groups outside of the total exclusion zone, British submarine cannons are required to get confirmation from sink fleet as a rules of engagement to allow combat with Argentine forces. Um, and that's for um, British submarines versus the Argentine task groups. Now, that's not tr the case, however, that we actually did um, have some sinking. So we are... It uh, looks like weapons hot. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering, a, 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 a majority of these units are still going to be here. Um, and I could potentially engage them. Now, someone might sneak out to the search box. And I want to have a sub here kind of in case that happens. But coastal, they're most likely standing at the coastal. I'm pushing both up to the coastal. That's what I'm doing. All right, so that was uh, task force, uh, the deployment of that. Cap, okay, I'm gonna have a lot of cap here. Uh, and in fact, I think I'm gonna be scrambling most of um, uh, Hermes. So let me get at least these um, six. I think, I think these six are coming no matter what. So, I'm going to have a pair coming here to um, the Western approach. It's the softest thing I've got. I think I'm then going to have one each here, 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 and here. Okay. Covered my bases pretty well. Um, I do anticipate something's going to happen. I'm now going to scramble two more. Actually, that's the end of cap. I will do supply interdiction. So I'm going to roll 2d6 on supply. I rolled a 2, so I've decremented supply another level. Okay. Don't have a lot left to scramble, but I do have one Harrier left on ready alert, if you will. SAS will stay right where they are. They've not had a change in their situation for a little bit. Naval deployment. Okay, I'll start with the submarines. They are both already out to sea. So uh, the first one will roll its 3d4. It actually stays where it is. The second one will roll its 3d4. It stays where it is. Okay, so nobody moves for the submarines. Um, now it's surface group readiness. There's one group. Oops, and I forgot to move you earlier. Okay. Um, the battle group potentially could get readied. It does. And now I will deploy groups. Uh, so I will deploy the carrier group. Potentially, it stays where it is. And I will now see what the patrol does uh, at 3d6. Uh, it stays in port. All right, so that display is exactly as we left it. We're now going to do sub v sub combat. So um, the first, um, essentially, I've not had the two on two here recently, but essentially, I'm going to get to try and um, do one, uh, one on ones here. So we have a, certainly a very contested box. For each British submarine in the box, roll one die of the value indicated on the detectional chart. And so in this case, that would be um, a D6. For each one rolled, um, an Argentine submarine has been detected. Okay, so, um, so this will be then a for each British submarine. So I will roll two D6s here in the coastal area to attempt to get the submarines. And one of them is successful. So I will pair off um, a British submarine and an Argentine submarine. Okay, no problem. And we'll now go on to sub v sub combat. Um, so for, um, for each British submarine on the combat display can now attack one detected Argentine submarine. For each attack, roll one die of the indicated number. Um, so uh, it's a D6. If one is rolled, I have destroyed the submarine. So roll in a D6, and I have destroyed the Argentine submarine. 
and it is that easy. Okay, so let me, I'll keep my spoils up here. There is the dead Argentine submarine. Well, all right, I'll take that. Um, for one's role, the Argentine submarine is destroyed. Remove it permanently from the game. If any other number it escapes, etc. All British submarines that were involved in the attack are now rotated 180. Put back on their naval display. So um, essentially, he's not going to be available to. Um, what are you? That's the carrier group. Um, to help with uh, um, prosecuting the uh, carrier. But he's done his job. Okay. So that was. Um, uh, me attacking them. When rolls have been made for British submarines, repeat the detection process for any Argentine submarine remaining in the contested box. Um, so we they will detect on a D8. So he'll get one D8 roll, and he will miss. So that's the end of sub combat. Now it's my sub versus their surface combatant. So the detection uh, in this case, in the coastal area, is a four. I will just go for it. Okay, nope, no detection. Shoot. Surface group versus British sub. So now the carrier group can attempt to detect the sub in coastal, which it does on a D6. It fails. And now we have the possibility of the Argentine Navy attacking the British task force. Um, and so this is a D8 uh, for its search role. And it fails. <clears throat> All right. So uh, Navy is complete. And now we'll see if uh, we get anything on the uh, air forces. Okay, so scramble surveillance early warning. Let me get to the correct section of this blade. Um, we have a scramble roll. It is unmodified and the level is three. So on one or a two they scramble. They will only scramble one rate. So D10, they do not scramble. All right, and that will do it. That will be the end of turn six. Let me do my cleanup here. Uh, so let's see, uh, Harrier recovery. I'll get all these guys back. Uh, we'll do our cycling. We'll uh, put you to ready, put you to arming. All right, big stack of all of Hermes getting turned around now. Um, and uh, we'll essentially put the weather marker back. And that will be completely the end of turn six. So um, we will now move on to turn seven. This is going to be a good time to um, uh, pause and take a break on the stream. I will continue uh, the game and the stream um, possibly off schedule. I might do it uh, during the weekend coming up. If not, um, it'll be uh, the subject of a stream possibly for uh, the month of December. Uh, we'll just kind of keep going through this. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join me. Those of you that are watching live, those of you that are catching uh, the, the playback on YouTube or the VOD, um, uh, thanks. Uh, feel free to uh, contact me with questions or leave feedback uh, on the video. Let me know what you thought. You can find me at uh, AlecMG on BoardGameGeek, uh, Twitter, or Twitch. Um, you can also find me on Reddit, uh, and you can join the conversation there at slash r slash hex and counter. Um, thank you all very much for joining me. I appreciate having you here, and um, until next time, have a good night.